All right. Welcome to the stream, everyone. I'm here with Landon Kurt Knoll, and if you don't know who Landon Kurt Knoll is, there's something wrong with you, because he is someone you should know about. But that's all right. I'm going to let him introduce himself, so he can tell you just why you should know him. Landon, take it away. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on your time zone and latitude and other sort of things from your friendly secular astronomer. I'm a planetary scientist, astronomer. Uh, I also work in the technology field, and I've done a bunch of stuff, and I get to be paid to study my favorite universe, which, like, how cool is that? I mean, that is pretty cool. <laughs> so uh, we're going to be talking about a number of uh, astronomy-related topics, because that is one of your big areas, is astronomy, right? Yeah. I mean, and I study planets in particular, um, okay. so... My fellow astronomers refer to me as a short-sighted astronomer because <laughs> most planets that we know of are nearby, right? And, right. Uh, we don't have the, the ability to detect planets very, very, very far away, just right. you know, like a thousand light years. And 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 I got colleagues that deal with you know the ten billion plus light year stuff. So, so well, yes, I'm a short-sighted astronomer, but but we have to study. You know, uh, and by the way, Earth is one of the planets that I study. Okay. Um, so we get the, the, the things of geology, what's, what's inside the core, meteorology, the weather on the surface, and then the outer space bit. And then how, how planets are formed and all stuff means you need to know about solar systems and how, how uh, you know, galaxies form and how they evolve and all that sort of stuff. So it's, it, you end up building up a lot of stuff in order to talk about planets, which is... Which is really cool. That's a cool. It's you're, yeah. you're you're bringing in a lot of different fields of knowledge together. Yeah. So and, and you might say that one of the one of the functions of the universe is to make planets for us to study. So <laughs> there you go. Awesome. So I think one place we wanted to go first was talking about things like astrobiology. So yes. Things like what, and I think one topic is how would we know if we found a life form that it wasn't actually just contamination from Earth. Assuming it's just a, that, assuming it's a microbe. I mean, if it's a, if it's a giant six-headed alien with antennae and tentacles, okay, fine. But let's say it's a little little bug, little microscopic guy. Yeah, I mean that that's that's a worry about you know exploring things like Mars. Right, is the risk of of taking and contaminating the the planet. I mean, there are protocols we will try to do in order to sterilize a a spacecraft, but that's not always successful. Um, once people land on Mars, then the contamination will begin. Um, well, yeah, but, in earnest. You know, yes, and so it's one of the reasons why you know I, I hope that we're able to do robotic exploration of Mars um, well before people show up, because it's very interesting to see you know what is Mars Mars like. Um, similarly, you know the, 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 the care that doing of these missions going to uh, Europa, which is a um, an ice core planet moon around Jupiter, mm -hmm. um, that that is also has has possibilities of being friendly to life. Right. Those are those are things that we need to be careful of as we're exploring. Now, if you see something that, that, that that's far out there, it's very unlikely something came from Earth. On the other hand, it's possible that the life that arrived on Earth came from elsewhere. That's, that's a good that's, point. Yeah. And and you know we we have learned a lot about uh, you know impactors on Earth and what you know how they how they behave and what they do and the fact that that you can have fairly complex chemicals survive a, a meteorite asteroid impact um, and how do we know that well we can take rail guns and blast things in it blast things as, 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 as targets. And, and see what's, what what survives. We could also find you know, amino acids in meteorites, like say, in Antarctica. So okay. when I go to the South Pole region and visit there, I scan it. Part of the thing is we're finding chunks of outer space that are embedded in pure water ice of a sterile environment that is essentially not contaminated by, by Earth's biosphere. And we can we can pretty much you know pretty be very certain that 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 amino acids that we find in those things are from out there. So the question is, does this stuff here come from out there? <clears throat> and I think that's one of those open questions that's still very much under investigation, right? That's a... Uh... Yeah, and, and it's a question that I talked to with people involved in phylogeny. 
which is, you know, is there, how certain are we that there's one route to, to life? Right. How, is, is it possible that Earth might have been contaminated more than once or from a different source and that those sources may be similar but not identical to? Right. Um, and um, I, that actually does touch on to some interesting uh, aspects of biology and how we can determine common ancestry. And so uh, what I would say that is the kind of the general consensus is that if that happened, it happened at a stage before the last universal common ancestor existed. Mm -hmm. Because it does seem like we have... Oh, and we get a hi, Landon, from Nikki. Hi, Nikki. Um, uh, so there are some things that make it seem like all life has a single common ancestor that was an identifiable population. Um, and some of those things that we actually might expect to be different in extraterrestrial life if we were to find it are things like all life uses the same set of amino acids, even though there's a larger set of amino acids that exist and could be used. Sure. In fact, um, there have been bacteria that have been engineered to use additional amino acids, and they work just fine as amino acids. So there's no reason these that life couldn't uh, develop with a different collection of amino acids as the ones that it uses. There'd probably be some overlap. But um, another one is that codon assignment in the genetic code is highly conserved. Mm -hmm. It's very uncommon to find uh, a life form where a particular codon meet, uh, produces a different result than in a different organism. So codons are a set of three um, base pairs in the genetic code. So every three sure. is a codon. And each one is assigned either an amino acid or a stop or start function. So... <clears throat> when a gene is read, the, um, you know, it's read as RNA, but the RNA goes and the, uh, the ribosome says, okay, this is a start codon. Then it starts reading every three um, base pairs. Base pairs. Is, yeah. is another amino acid that's going to add on to whatever it's making. Then it hits a stop codon and it says, okay, I'm done. But what codon means what is very highly conserved. Um, basically, there's only two... Uh, coding methods. One is the one used by mitochondria and eukaryotes, and the other mm -hmm. one is used by basically everything else. And even those two code systems are very similar. There's only a few differences. So, so could could um, well, you're talking about in terms of oh, there's only use of certain amino acids, um, but obviously those amino acids are possibly being present here on Earth, and they didn't use them. So the presence of those alternate amino acids <clears throat> didn't cause life to evolve into overly right. really complex the systems. Um, so could, you know, could we have a situation where the common ancestor is really a common set of life that, that arrived at Earth over a period of time, and we just see the blending of, of those things as opposed to there's one thing that, that started, one cell arrived on a on an asteroid, survived, and, and, and populated the Earth. So that is one of those areas where it's, it's not obvious how we would test for that difference. Um, yeah. Currently, everything is compatible with the idea that there was a single common, last universal common ancestor, and that mm -hmm. both before and after this, there would have been other populations alive that would have in, had... Um, lateral gene or horizontal gene transfer between populations yeah so it's it's tricky because with that degree of horizontal gene transfer so early in the history of life it actually becomes a bit blurry as to what it means to have a single common ancestor sure and that's why i said i think it's possible that let's say if life um developed on mars right before earth right with mars we know has a had a had an early history when it has still had enough you know it it had um, an atmosphere because it's you know that is already leaked away and other conditions like water and so forth you could have had life um, arrive at Mars or or evolve on Mars and get transported to to Earth how because things impact Mars um, uh, like asteroids stuff scatters off of it. And, and and lands on, on Earth. We we have meteorites here on Earth that we know kind came from Mars, right? Because we set probes on right. Mars, 
that have done the identification. So it's possible that Earth could have been contaminated by a series of Martians, let's say. Right. And and what you have on that common ancestor was the Martian group of, of life that that you know took off. Yeah. Because it's I think you know, arrival life arriving on uh, and surviving an asteroid, it's very unlikely to be a complex life form that can survive. Right. I couldn't or survive a that. Simple life form. Yeah. Yeah. Bags of water and meat don't really do well. Nope, they are they are decelerated in an very bad way. <laughs> but but there are critters that, that that can survive, and that's been one of the things you know that that, that early on when the discussion about life outside uh, college, there there was a much more narrow notion of well, it's got to be between this different temperature, this pH, this pH, you know, the, the light has this small spot. And we now know so much more about extremophiles here on Earth that you, you start to find that stuff like Mars isn't so far out there as far as being able to be, you know, a biological ground. It's not, it's not going to be a, 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 a giant, you know, Royal Botanical Garden on, on its own. Um, but right. on the other hand, Mars is not too far off Neither is Europa, neither is Enceladus, other places in our solar system where life could be there or could arrive and, and get a hole. Okay. Now, we have a, an interesting question from Puffalopagus in the chat. And he says, mm -hmm. uh, if panspermia was the way that Earth was, quote, seeded, wouldn't we expect to continue to see new organisms or protoorganisms popping up in newly fallen meteorites? Excellent question, right? Now, um, again... The, the type of thing of what you know what might have happened um you know if if for example you're, you're talking about say you know a a single cell life form gets to ride on an asteroid and manage to survive the impact and 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 you know, take off um those events are probably fairly rare right mm -hmm. asteroids fortunately are not you know after the era of heavy bombardment was over are fortunately not common occurrences, right? So right. the amount of big stuff arriving, um, smaller objects have a problem that when they come in the atmosphere, they tend to break up and shatter and they're much more, um, you have to be inside a rock protected, even then you'd have-, you'd so have There's like a minimum size requirement for the rock that might be able to do this. Yes, and and and, and bigger rocks are rarer. Uh, smaller rocks are, so 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 you have that, that going for you. Also the thing is that, you know, so, so having find an amino acid in a, in, in, a, in a meteorite is not on a common thing. We, we find amino acids out in space, right? From radio right. telescopes, we can see thousands of them. So just because it's amino acid doesn't mean that there's critters there. Uh, but if you talk about transferring of, of how it came to Earth, it, it is quite, because the question could be, well, then why don't we see other critters? Showing up. Why don't we see all of a sudden some has genetic tree and it's got a different root, right? Right, which is what um, we would expect for alien life. Yes, unless of course the uh, there's a problem of alien life surviving, let's say interstellar, and that you know it it more within our, our local group or even our local solar system that might be a um, that you end up having life that's much more similar to 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 itself in Germany as opposed to something way out there. Okay. I don't think I was answering the, the question because we, we don't know, but we can speculate. Well, one thing I was thinking is that um, if life had arrived here on an asteroid, it probably would have originated somewhere else in the solar system. And that sure. because over time, the rate of asteroid bombardment has gone down and many of the other places that would have been hospitable earlier to life no mm -hmm. longer are, then the, simply the chances that any given meteorite would end up going yeah. from one of those places, happening to have a life form on it, and then happening to end up on Earth, and then for that organism to survive, and then for us to find it, every step in this gets yeah. less and less and less likely as you go. And so that's sure. one of the things that I was thinking. Yeah, and, and, and I understand you know, one of the things that, that that's our understanding of models of source system have improved, um, there used to be the notion of, you know, there's an asteroid belt. There's a spot, if you look at the zone, orbital zones, you know, Mercury zone, Venus zone, Earth, Mars, and then there's this asteroid belt before you get to the Jovian zone. Um, 
know, the, the thought was that the asteroid, the other side conjecture was that maybe the asteroid belt was a planet that broke up and you just see pieces. Well, right. now we know that that asteroid belt just does not have enough mass to accrete to do anything other than form like the, the dwarf planet series. Um, there isn't just enough stuff. Also, if our model of how the solar system formed is reasonably correct, uh, Jupiter, the, the big heavyweight outside of the sun, you know, pulled up lots of material, you know, uh, gravitationally pulled in there. So, so um, Mars is relatively anemic as far as, as mass, right? It's, 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 it's a fairly light like planet. So in it doesn't have an atmosphere, right? Right. Like, like much of an atmosphere. Right. Uh, Technically, it, it has on. an atmosphere, but it's... Like 1% of, of Earth's thing or something like that, or if I recall correctly. It's less than um, 1% of, I, I think. Yeah, I think it probably isn't less. Maybe it's a tenth of a percent. <clears> it's, something it's, like it's that. A low, it's, it, it's, it's a low, low pressure and, and... It's enough to get dust storms, is, but, you know, that's about it. You know, part of the problem is that without the mass of Mars, um, you know, gases like oxygen... Uh, at a at a even Mars colder temperature, achieves gate velocity. So Earth has enough mass, and the temperatures are such that that things like high, you know things like oxygen and nitrogen and carbon can't achieve gate velocity with normal temperature. Temperature is you know how fast stuff wiggles around, right? Mm -hmm. And and if you have enough, you can boil down the zero way. Well, the case of Mars is it's it, it's got so little little mass that it can't hold on to it. So these people that talk about terraforming Mars and 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 gender and atmosphere, well that atmosphere will stick for a while until it leaks away and you get yeah. back to Mars. Yeah. So anyway, that, that thought people thought, well maybe that 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 zone, asteroid zone was a planet and it broke up in pieces of it or hitting Earth. Okay. Um, now we know no it just it, it didn't have enough material to accrete to anything of reasonable size, particularly because of Jupiter ripping it off. So um, the, 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 in our solar system, the places that you could, you could form stuff are, are somewhat limited. Um, again, presuming it's obviously it's not going to go anywhere near the sun and yeah. big gas giants like Jupiter, Saturn don't have services to really do much. So the notion of life spontaneously starting on an asteroid is, is pretty impromptu, you know, it's less likely than on a surface like like Earth, Mars, Europa, and Solidus. So, so if you find life material on an asteroid, um, it's not because some planet broke up and that's a piece going along. You got to get the asteroid contaminated somehow. Okay. Um, and then that 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 piece of asteroid has to come and hit Earth, right? So it's it's a, yeah. it's a harder topic. It's a harder model to to. But you know, I had my you know, my biologist sort of say. With you know biology and physics, you get life, so it doesn't have to be that life forms elsewhere and comes here. It could actually have formed here from the beginning, right? And I think that you know it's there's always the possibility, and like you said, there's also the possibility that very on, <coughs> I'm sorry, very early on, maybe life formed on Earth as well as elsewhere, and then there was cross contamination, which then led to some mixing if the life was similar enough, and then we get into questions of like how how many ways can life form? Because it seems like it seems like life can form, and by how many ways can it form, I mean how many different sort of first life forms are hypothetically possible? Because they wouldn't all be identical, but are there so many different kinds of first organisms that could form that they would be so incompatible that they couldn't have any mixing, or would they have to be similar for some reason to the point that there sure. could be mixing? I mean, the, 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 the question comes down to the, what is life and how would we detect it. And, right. you know, with the case of, of, of understanding basic uh, you know, atoms in chemistry, you know that you have so many atoms. I mean, if an atom is defined by the number of, of protons in a nucleus, and there's one, two, three, up to, you know, now 118, but, but most of them are below 92, or 92 or less. And so there's only so many ways that those atoms combine. And in the case of really rich chemistry, carbon is a really amazing stuff in terms of, of, of where it is in the periodic table and all the stuff that you combine with it. I mean, carbon is a really great way of forming really complex, interesting 
It's like Stop. it's like the erector set of uh, atomic exactly. nuclei, yeah. Right? And and if you look at your body, um, and you say, well, you know, what are you? Your your there's hydrogen, um, oxygen, carbon, I mean, uh, nitrogen. You just named some of the most common elements um, uh, in the universe, right? Yeah. And now, yeah, helium is there too, but helium is a is, is basically a, 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 a noble gas. Yeah, it's very carbon. boring chemically. Yeah, but but hydrogen, you, you 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 if you put a bunch of atoms together, your carbon's going to start creating these really complex stuff because it's really kind of the glue of things. And you got carbon, you got some nitrogen, you got some hydrogen, oxygen. You know, you are made of the common elements of the universe for 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 a reason because that's kind of commonly what's around. So when we find a planet out there. And we say, you know, it, it might be sort of Earth-like. What, what usually we sort of say is that, well, you know, and the question is, you know, how do you find a planet that might be habitable? What do you mean by that? Well, we probably say that that first of all, the planet needs to be, it can't be too far away from a star because it would be just hydrogen and be frozen. Right. You get much chemistry. It can't be too close to the star because it would just be, you know, plasma or molds and stuff and not very interesting. You want to be in that spot where it's not too cold, not too hot. You also want it to not be too massive because if it gets really massive, then you get this, you tend to get these atmospheres, thick atmospheres piling around it. And so you get something like a, a Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, right. that there's a rocky core, but it's underneath a massive atmosphere and it's just not a really good surface area to go. So you want a rocky planet. Um, a lot of the planets, most of the rocky planets are, are, are Pluto-like, um, dwarf planets, and so, but they're hard to detect, right? They're, they're, they're much, right. Much That's lighter. one of the reasons we, we tend we, to detect kind of super Earth deals, right? Yeah, easy. right. Right now, but but when you know if you know that statistical bias, you consider and say, well, Earth's type planets are are something because if it gets if you get it if it gets too small, it can't hold on atmosphere. I mean, it it it, it, it you want to be near a star enough to get nice energy to have chemistry going, but not boiling and and turn the plasma and not cryogenic like frozen. You want to be sort of in that middle spot. But then you have to have enough mass to hold on to an atmosphere. Um, otherwise, you'd be, you'd get something like you know, Mars. Um, now, you can't be too close. It's something like Venus, where you get greenhouse gases and stuff, you know, runaway stuff. So you want that middle, kind of that middle ground. Um, now, it's like Goldilocks. The thing, yeah, yeah, but the fortunate thing is that there are lots of planets. That's one of the things that I guess that the planetary science that was really that's really exciting, right? Uh, one take, one takeaway from this stuff about planetary science is that we now have strong evidence that planets are are more common than stars, right? They're not rare objects; they're actually fairly common objects. Right. That about seventy percent of stars that are single stars, like our, our sun, have planets, plural. And even 30% of binary stars and multiple star groups have planets in around them. Right. So in this galaxy where there's roughly, let's say, 200 billion stars, there is at least a trillion planets orbiting those, those stars, at least. And, and, and that, I say at least because there's some of the smaller ones that are more, you know, Mercury, Mars, let alone Pluto-like, uh, are, are, are ones that are very, very hard to detect. So that's probably a lower bound. So lots and lots of planets, and they come in all kinds of varieties of shapes and sizes and, and, and orbits and other things. So when you look at, for example, the, you know, the current, you say, well, what's, what's the current state of affairs, right? And there's a really nice, um, there's actually a really nice website people should, should be aware of. Um, it's called the Extra, Extra Solar Planets Encyclopedia, and it's, Exoplanet, E X O P L A N E T dot E U, right? And it's and it's a catalog of confirmed planets, not the ones we suspect, but ones we've had. It's more than one method of saying yes, there's a planet there. And right now, the planet is four. The catalog has four thousand one hundred eight planets wow. as of September 9th. All right, right? that's um, that was just so, linked in the chat. So anyone who wants to, go ahead. And, and you, there's a database there. You can look at diagrams about size and shape and so forth. You can understand that to, to, to track that to a population, you have to say, well, how would they detect it, right? And there's 
various detection methods bias it towards certain types, but we understand the bias and and still that list will show you an incredible variety of planets. And again, these are planets where someone has 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 feigned a potential discovery, and then there's another method, another person that confirms that. So they're 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 solid, pretty solid stuff. And um, of that 4,108, there are probably several dozen that are Earth-like planets, meaning <clears throat> maybe a half Earth mass to two Earth mass, somewhere around that range, in the Goldilocks zone, where it's between, you know, it's not completely frozen, it's not completely you know, molten, it's somewhere in between. Right. Um, so there's a couple dozen planets, depending on how wide your zone is. And this, let's go back to the astrobiologists and say, okay, we've got these array wide variety of platforms where interesting chemistry can start going. You tell us biologists how, <laughs> how what's the range of stuff, right? Before it, 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 it you can get something now. And that's actually uh, a, a bit of a problem for a yes, lot of biologists. Sure. And so one of the problems there is that our sample size uh, for biospheres is currently one. Yes. Which, I mean, for anyone who's familiar with things like statistics and <laughs> science, you'll know that a sample size is of one is really, really useless. Yes. So the thing yes. is, it's like, okay, well, we have an example of a biosphere, and we can think up kind of hypothetical ideas about how a biosphere could be different, but without sure. additional samples, it's very hard to test any of this. And I perfectly understand that because, you know, in, in planetary science, we had one solar system mm -hmm. until we started finding planets out there. Right. And as we get better and better detection, we're getting more and more planets. Now we have a large enough sphere of, of stuff we can begin to make statistically meaningful statements about planets. Right. Um, but our four biologist friends, you know, have to have to contend with a more limited sample size, but hopefully <laughs> a much more something. limited sample size. <laughs> so, but but again, I we were in that same position with as, as, as planetary scientists. Oh, that's so. True. So um, I think I think when people you know, there's a question that I don't really answer, but you know, it's one of the it's that you're in a taxi cab or Uber or Lyft car, and I prefer Lyft and. Um, and they, you know, this they, you know, what do you do? Um, you know, astronomer, blah, 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 blah. And usually at some point, oh, God, well, they would say, do you think there's life in outer space, right? Are we alone? That's one of the common questions people ask. And right. what, well, actually what they say is, do you believe in extraterrestrials? And I try not to answer that question directly because I think it's, I think it's a, I think it's a question which is not well formed. So I usually, when someone says, do you believe in extraterrestrials, do you believe in life in outer space or life elsewhere? Um, I usually say, well, what I believe has really nothing to do with what is or what isn't. Right. right? So asking me what I believe is irrelevant because the universe doesn't give a damn what I believe, right? It's going to do what it does, right? Right. It so, doesn't ask your permission. So, yes. Exactly. So I, I try to then say, well, maybe the question you want to ask is, given what we know now in the data, would you, would you expect there to be life elsewhere in the universe, galaxy, and so forth? And the response is, I would find it shocking and really surprising if we were the only life in the universe. That would be just, that would be, that would be, you know, mind boggling you know, unexpected. And if we only have one universal, like biology, we have this problem of sample size, but right. I would find it highly improbable that we're the only life in the universe, let alone life in our solar system, you know, in, 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 our, in, our, in our galaxy. Right. Um, there's, a, there's a possible chance that we might, there might be life elsewhere in our solar system. Um, Mars is still an open question. Europa's got really fascinating stuff. It's all this in the so there's a couple of spots that, that might have biological critters or something like that going right. on. But I, I think that the chances of us being alone are so low that I would find it really surprising if we were.
Now, uh, there's a question, and I'm not sure that I n understand it, but maybe you do. Um, it's from Puff Up, I guess, again. And he says, which would Landon put his money on if he had to choose? So no we weaseling out of this one. Uh, okay. The terrascope to find more Earth-sized planets or missions to the ice moons to sample their subsurface oceans for life. I'm not sure why that's a dichotomy, mm. but... Okay, well, the guy I'm kind of get, you've got a budget to do space exploration. Right. Do you, do you put it into a telescope to look for planets elsewhere, but, but not only look for planets, but also analyze planets? Or, or you put your money into something that say, maybe it's Europa, and you roll the dice and hope you get something there. Um, the, the, I'll answer that question. Um, and, and, but, but you yeah, understand what are, what, are the, what are these two possibilities? Because again, let's assume government says you got this much money, you can do one or the other, but you can't, you don't have money to do both. Right. Unfortunately, then, and you have to pick and choose. How would you choose? Well, one of the things that you can do with, with telescopes, particularly like even radio telescopes, is you can do some really interesting, you know, spectral analysis of a planet around a nearby star. Right. Um, there are two telescopes, by the way, on the way, just so there's one is a radio telescope called the Square Kilometer Array. If you look for squarekilometerarray.org, um, SK telescope, um, you'll find this, this telescope array that's being built, part of it in South Africa, part of it in Australia, is going to have extraordinary capabilities. It's, it's, it's going to have a surface area we're receiving service area for each of the three frequency bands of, of the square kilometer. So it's going to be, it's, a, it's, it's going to have very um, ability to take, get very, very faint radio sources and can also have very high directional sets. So the hope is that um, we will be able to, with precision, look at planets around nearby stars that have lightning storms and look at the map, the lightning storms and see some of the, potential chemistry in those atmospheres of those planets. Wait, I'm sorry, hold on. The you're you're going to try and collect light from a lightning storm on another planet. Well, radio telescope, right? Yeah, a radio telescope to, to look at. Because now, so so here's here's how you do it, right? You, 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 let's say you have a planet around a nearby star. Okay. And the planet, that's, that's, the star is not completely wacky in terms of... of Big outbursts and the planets in the Goldilocks zone, and, other things. and you're not going to know where the orbit is. But because let's say the the planet is one of those that transits, that is, as the planet passes in front of the star, the star like dims because they happen to be in the plane. So we 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 know where it is in the plane. We know its period. So we know when it's on that side of this planet, that side of the star, that's that side of the star. Then you to radio telescope rays and you use your know, interferometry and you narrow into that 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 spot when the planet's at that sweet spot area, and then you try to get radio frequency you know, uh, spectrometry. It's not just you detect a radio signal, but you, you have a spectrum that you can go and sit there and say, look, here's nitrogen, here's, here's carbon, here's oxygen, here's da 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 da, and look at these rich stuff. And, and one of the things that, you know, planets are not really shout much in the radio, Spectrum. I mean, okay, ET might be shouting, but we don't haven't found that yet. The more likely <laughs> you're going to get from a radio telescope is a planet having an atmosphere, right? Because the the ones that are that that, that atmosphere has lightning storms because it's got a magnetic field and you've got charged particles and other things. So you can create, you can generate these bzz, 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 and and those lightning bolts send out radio waves, and you have a big detector area of a square kilometer here on Earth to get those signals and analyze them. Um, that's going to be one of the targets for stuff nearby. And we'll start with things like, you know, there's, a, there's an interesting planet next to Proxima Centauri, which is the, the next closest star besides our sun. Um, and to see if we can begin to detect what's there. So that's going to be one area that they're going into these telescope arrays. They're going to try to get us up. Another one is the James Webb Telescope. Um, is a telescope to be launched. It's going to be the successor to the Hubble because Hubble's getting pretty old, and yeah. it's got old technology anyway. So we need a we need a uh, you know a two point space telescope definitely. But one of the things that that the uh, James Webb is optimized for 
is infrared. The wavelengths that are that are that are longer than your 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 colors, your rainbow. So it's going to look at stuff below that 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 that, and particularly those are. Those are radio frequencies. Those are light frequencies that are emitted by things that are not as hot as a star. So if you want to look for a planet, right. you want you don't want to be looking at 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 sun, you know, glowing stuff. Yeah, you want to be looking at red. You want the ones that are a bit saner temperatures that are they're they're colder, right? right. Um, now the problem with detecting planets or nearby stars is a star is shining very bright, even though. You know, they're, they're right next to each other. So I mean, with a radio telescope, that's a hard thing to do. So one of the techniques that's going to be used with the, the, the James Webb telescope, it's going to be outer space, so it won't be contaminated by Earth's atmosphere or the or the distortion of, of our, our atmospheric gases. And they're going to use something called a star shade. And a star shade is nothing more fancy than a giant umbrella, right? A spacecraft's going to travel at a very precise location a distance of but it's a high uh, precision a space umbrella so let's not downsell it too much sure yes and it's you know and it's umbrella on the or part of like you know uh 10 meters or we get across type of thing but it's going to it's going to operate a distance and it's going to be let's say it's going to be a uh a, you know a, a million or so kilometer about a, maybe my uh, a million miles away from the telescope but pass right in front of the star. And so the period of time where it passes right in front of the star and, and you know and blocks the star's light out, then the giant James Webb can then go and focus in on the spot and get an image of the planets and get spectral data while that thing is passing in front of the star. So we, we blink the star out and, and look around it. And, and we do it at such time frequently we know that the planet's orbiting, but when it's on this side or that side, and, and we can narrow down that thing and start to get some really good spectra nice. of, of some of the stars, right? Now, will we find something? Well, it depends on whether the, the, the equipment works and and we might point at the at, at really bad planets that are boring chemically. Um, you know, you gotta take your chances and try, but you gotta look. So now, there are some things. So, so that's, that's, that's at the telescope side. Now, he says- I do have what, a, a quick what, question so, uh, relating sure. to this. And this is from Unidentified Leviathan, who's been on my channel since, basically since I actually really started in earnest. And um, <clears throat> he says, what if we really are the only planet to have life? What then? Like, what, what would that mean for, for science, for humanity? I think it means if, if, if the, at the odds of this large universe of all this time and all those opportunities, um, and, and, and we're it, then it says that there's a process about life um, sustaining that we don't quite understand that, that weeds out all the other attempts. Um, it also says that we might want to go and contaminate other planets ourselves. But back to some of this our, okay. uh, question. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I, I, I gave you the, the motivation for why you want to have telescopes. Mm -hmm. And, and the next generation telescopes are going to have fantastic capabilities, and that you know, we're going to not only will we find planets even farther out, but we'll be able to analyze other planets relatively close by and get some really good data. Now, here's the problem, right? If with a space telescope, if I said, "Hey, Dapper, we have this planet. It's around melting point of ice. It's got water. It's got nitrogen. It's got carbon compounds." It's got hydrogen. Um, does it have life? Yeah, that's a hard question to answer. Um, I mean, that, that's the next. Yeah. So there are some ideas, so, though, about what you would want to look for. Sure. And the biggest one is, so planets that don't have life that we've seen close up all mm -hmm. tend to have a fairly... Uh, a, pretty well in balance equilibrium when it comes to chemistry. They have the kind of chemistry that you would expect if this chemical environment had been there for a few billion years doing nothing sure. particularly interesting. Whereas the one planet that we know of that does have a biosphere has a very out of whack chemistry where there is a, a strong disequilibrium. It's the kind of chemistry yeah. that you don't expect to be stable without something weird going on. Mm -hmm. And so 
<clears throat> it doesn't necessarily have to be oxygen, but I would say that if we find the presence of highly reactive chemicals in abundance in a planet that we can be well assured is fairly old, then that's, that's curious enough to say that is a pretty good indicator that there might be life messing up the chemistry here because life sure. essentially is a practice in chemical to equilibrium. When life reaches yeah. chemical equilibrium, that's what Excellent. death is. And, and, and we, you know, when people ask me, well, you know, planetary scientists, well, you know, you're looking for life. What are you really, you're really looking for? Because what is life? And I say, I'm not a biologist. So, <laughs> but, but I say, well, here's what I'm, here's what we're looking for. We're looking for complex chemical systems that have imperfect replication processes. Right. And that, that, who, that announce themselves in the electromagnetic spectrum so that we can detect them. Right. What does that mean? Well, you've got chemistry that's evolving and we, it does it in a way that we can see it or we can detect it, you know, by radio waves or other sort of, of processes or, or it, it, it gets complex enough that it builds its own sitcoms and beams radio signals at us or whatever. I mean, I don't know, but, right. but the question is, can we find these imperfectly evolving replicating chemical systems of complex environments that can be detected by the light right. that, that we can detect. And, uh, that's, that's what we're looking for. And Ben Idzikowski asks, uh, what compounds uh, would we be looking for to confirm likely biochemical processes? Like what ratios? And um, basically, as far as what compounds, it would be pretty much any compound that would likely react away very rapidly without being constantly replenished. Mm. <clears throat> so O2 or O3 would be really good options, but they're not the only ones. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sure. there are other gases that react very quickly. Uh, there are sodium gases that could be, we know that some life forms on earth metabolize sodium compounds for energy. And so if we saw a chemical, at, an atmosphere with rich sodium chemistry that was rich in compounds that are not long lived. Like we saw lots of, I don't know, sodium hexafluoride sure. somewhere. Because sodium hexafluoride li likes to decay away in the presence of lots of things. Yes. So if we saw, you know, oh, hey, there's a strange amount of free sodium hexafluoride, I would say, well, that could be a sodium, you know, metabolizing biosphere producing this. Exactly. And so, and, so, and one of the things, so, so his original question on what I paid, so I've given you the case for telescopes. The other thing, of course, that tells folks is this is this is the sample size is you can you can search out you know quite a long ways. You have lots of planets. You have and if, if there's if you're playing the odds and you want to find something that might have some weird might even just weird microbes or or, or pond scum or something like that, um, you've got a much better chance of finding it through telescopes. That being said, um, the problem is that the the likelihood of the telescope discovery is going to be initially be controversial, right? That the, the New York Times or the so forth will show up on the Twitter feed and say, someone will say, life discovered, right? And you look at the behind the headlines and it says, well, they see some stuff that looks like it could be hydrocarbons. And, right. um, and you sit there and say, is that life? Maybe, maybe. It, maybe. we definitely maybe. aren't ready to set up our alien zoo. Yes, so so that's kind of. I think the first discoveries are going to be probable. They'll be hyped by the press, and then they'll be debunked, or they'll say, "Well, actually, this could also be this other chemical signature and spectral stuff." Because spectra, spectroscopy is hard, but they for all those all those organic chemicals that that wiggle in weird ways. Um, <laughs> and, and so, because it's much it's much easier to detect. You know, uh, helium ionized helium compounds that it is right. Long carbon chains that wiggle in strange ways. So the first detections are going to be, you know, probable, uh, not very satisfying. That being said, let's take the other question, which was right. in space. Yeah, let's let's send a probe um, to to Europa or something. Yeah, and where you go? Well, you know, the 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 thing about Mars is, and I think. It's fair so to say that we don't know whether life, there's life on Mars at the moment. Right. Um, there's not abundant life. Uh, there's sort of the surface appears to be quite sterile, but there's lots of stuff underneath. We know that Mars has a very significant permafrost 
even to the point where on Mars, you know, 30 degrees of latitude above and below the equator, there's permafrost, you know, um, down, down deep, large, you know, large ice, lots of water there. Mm -hmm. that, that Mars once had oceans and the thing to boil away, froze, and is, is, is in the law. Another thing is that Mars has a trace amount of methane. Mm -hmm. We detect this methane, and methane in Mars atmosphere has a half-life of around 80 years. What do you mean by that? Well, if you put a bunch of methane out in Mars atmosphere, in 80 years, half of it will decay because the ultraviolet light from the sun, radiation from the sun, breaks it down. Right. That's a very so short half-life. Yeah, the presence of, of methane on Mars we can detect means there's something generating it that hasn't been primordial. The problem, of course, is just because you say it's methane doesn't mean it's biological. Right. It could be. Right. But is it? It could be. Could could be, you know, because a lot of methane on Earth is things farting. It's the old fart jokes up. But is there some single cell organisms? deep in the Martian rocks that are slowly outgassing methane, and that's what we're detecting. Well, one of the things that they're going to try to do with the next generation space probes is, again, they're talking about really, really faint traces of methane, is to get enough of a sample that we can start to look at the carbon-12, carbon-13 ratios. Carbon, what do you know? Well, carbon comes in different, you know, as in, like carbon means you've got six protons. But there's a form of carbon where you have six protons and six neutrons. Another one with six protons and seven neutrons. There's also carbon 14, which is decays, you don't have six and eight. But in biological cells, they tend to concentrate certain types of, 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 of carbon over others. So if you found, if you if you sample the carbon on Mars and know your ratio of 12 to 13. And then you sample the carbon that's in methane, and right. you find the ratios are different, then you might presume there is some sort of concentrator of an isotope. Which, which would there are not many natural concentrators by isotope, or natural yeah, non-biological, -biological. right? Yeah, yeah. And one of the things is why you know in in, in we got to do a better job exploring Mars before humans show up there, and we then we get our grubby hands over everything. Everything, yeah. Um, so another spot is Europa. Europa is this really fascinating uh, uh, dwarf planet, moon around Jupiter. It's one of the roundest objects that we know of in, in, the, in the solar system. And um, it's an ice covered ball with all very, very few um, um, impact craters. And the reason why is anything that hits it, the, 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 it, the model is the other that you've got a thin ice shell with a Huge ocean underneath, or you got kind of a slushy, slurpy type of, of thing. With, with Sounds delicious. Effect. Space slurpy. Uh, and, and, and moreover, when you see the ice blocks, you know, the probes that go near it, you see stuff coming up between the ice blocks that it, so it has this darkened material that looks like there's, you know, it's, there's dirty water underneath, so there's goop underneath it. Um, Ma, uh, Europa has over six times the mass of water that there is in Earth's oceans. Wow. It's a non-trivial ocean world. Yeah, I'll say that's non-trivial. Um, another thing is that, 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 that it, has a, it does have a core in, in, in the center and a magnetic field. So you've got this magnetic field to help shield your stuff from, from Jupiter's radiation. On the other hand, Jupiter's radiation can mix up your chemistry, right? Right. Um, Maybe it's in a nice little it's, medium it's, area. And, and part of the thing is that the tide systems as such, and, and, and the, the tidal flexures such that, you know, the Earth, uh, the, you know, um, Earth tides are puny compared with Europa. Europa is not much bigger, around, on the size of our moon, just a little bit bigger than the moon, but a few percent bigger. But Europa's tides, the, we, it's, it's ice moves up and down 500 meters over wow. 1,600 feet every two times 84 hours, every, every 84 hours, I should say, it's cycling. So it's got... It's, it's definitely got lots of water, and it's got stuff besides water. When 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 the stuff breaks open and and the stuff comes up and freezes, you can see interesting bits. So it's really intriguing to go there and say, let's go and sample that stuff. So if you if you said you have one place to search for life, 
besides Earth, where would you go? I would send a probe to Europa. Okay. And the European Space Agency, NASA is doing that. There's also Enceladus as well. So, what are the chances that there's life there? I don't even know how we would calculate it. Mm, Not zero? Uh, you know, worth enough to spend the money to go and look. Yeah. Yeah, I would say if it's we... not zero and it's not one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's what and, I will say. And, but if, if we found that there was critters on Mars producing methane, not just some, some, some or, you know, inorganic process, if we found that there was some sort of life systems on going on around on Europa, um, that would be pretty amazing. Because the next thing you'd want to go is say, okay, now we got to go in. And does it have DNA and sequence it? And all the biologists want to know, tell me more, right? Um, the problem with finding life by a telescope way out there is there's less likely to be able to go out there and sample it. Right. And it's even just harder to confirm. If a big European eel swims up next to your probe, well, yeah. I mean, it's hard to come to yeah. any other conclusion. And sure. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so we have a, a question. Um, is there a way to observe plate tectonics on ex exoplanets? Sorry, I can't talk for some reason. Exoplanets. Um, there, 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 there may be, um, but if you talk about exoplanet motion, that's really, that's gonna be really, really hard. I mean, it's hard enough right now to do it on Earth. We use laser beams. In fact, this, this, this is the observatory, the observatory. There is this particular telescope here, a three meter telescope, 120 inch mirror. And there's a 60,000 watt laser that we pulsed off of the mirror and pointed at the moon. And there are spots where the Apollo astronauts landed and left coil reflectors, and we can get the return bounce back and forth. That, you know, that that system is what was used very the first time to have very direct measurements that North America is moving over the planet because we could. We can we know where the moon is, and we can basically see the telescopes moving because of continental drift. This right. is pre GPS, right? We're able to, to find it. Um, doing that on exoplanets would be harder. Um, you probably, if you look, because we know what we think, you know, what, what what geology looks like. If you if you had a surface map or part of it, you can tell motions going on. And for example, when you flew past Pluto, um, what shocked us was it's got geology. It's got Thingy is moving. It's got cryo volcanoes. It's got crazy yeah, it's, it's not just stuff on it. undifferentiated rock and ice. Yes, and and and, and so uh, the answer would be that that you wouldn't detect the, the continents by moving. You would detect the surface geology and say yes, there's right. interesting geology going on. Now that actually uh, <clears throat> brings up because I, I want to move into some of the um, the creationist sections where how, how does this intersect because that is kind of the focus of the channel so okay i'm going to describe to you to the best of my understanding something called the hydroplate theory hydroplate right? the hydroplate no uh so this is a <laughs> idea in flood geology and flood geology is essentially saying that most, hydrology no or, no or you know about noah's flood noah's flood this noah's is the idea that noah's noah's flood explains a large portion of the geological features of Earth. Most flood geologists will say that there are there are geological features from after and some from before, but they'll say that basically 90 plus percent of the Phanerozoic strata are all the result of the flood. So there's a question in flood geology, which is where does the water come from? And so the hydroplate theory posits that before the flood, Rather than having just the kind of silicate crust followed by, you know, the upper mantle, lower mantle, the outer core, inner core, whatnot, <clears throat> that there was an upper silicate crust. And then below that, there was a large layer of either one continuous layer of water or perhaps a layer where there was extremely extensive water pools that may have been discontinuous. And then there was another section of silicate crust before you get to the outer mantle. So, so there's like these these oceans underneath the uh, continental plates, or and perhaps even underneath the oceanic plates too, because the Bible says that the fountains of the deep opened up, and so 
perhaps these were oceanic plates splitting apart and then water was rushing up from this hydroplate theory idea. So what do, you, what do you think about that from a planetary science standpoint? That sounds pretty improbable, but, but I, cause, cause if somebody were spouting that thing, I would ask questions like, can you help me understand, for example, what happens when a volcano, it, 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 so let's say you're saying under North America, there was this ocean that was, we're riding on this ocean and somehow it broke open, blood spawners came out. Well, how do you, how do you explain, for example, large earthquakes not cracking it open or volcanoes coming up from the mantle, going up through the water, not somehow boiling it and coming down the surface? Um, how do you explain plate tectonics and things cracking and dividing, like, like you know, um, Africa is slowly tearing us over to pieces. How do you explain the stretching that would not cause this, I guess you, are these like ocean blisters? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of bizarre. So there's a bunch of things I would say, well, how would you explain these things? And I would look for someone to try to explain it as opposed to apologize and say it's true and therefore let me rationalize it. Right. Um, and, and also the other thing is that, that, that you say, well, okay, um, so you've got this water in this highly compressed state, but it's heated, right? What's, what's in what phase is this stuff in? Is it, or is it, is it ices? Is it liquid water? And I believe um, it's usually it, supposed to be liquid water, right? Liquid water. And then somehow it broke open and it did everything break open or just one spot, right? Because we don't see them today. We, we don't see that. Because we can map, you know, earthquakes, pulses, and, and nuclear explosion pulses through the Earth. We have a pretty good idea about, about motion of material and vibrations. And if there was this big pocket of water, it would really stand out. Right. The, it would not be the kind of thing you could hide at this point. Yes. So, so there is no giant subterranean ocean underneath Earth's crust today. Well, so, except in the new Godzilla okay. movies. Oh, because okay. there is in those. So we're going to let that pass. We'll, we'll give them a okay, pass. Okay, but maybe that's an alternative Earth. Um, <laughs> so, 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 so what would so you'd have to come up and say? Well, there's only an ocean in one spot. Did it all come up? Because, because if they're under continents, then why would Asia stuff break open and South America not? Or would it be just one giant ocean? And then when it collapses, they're going to get really dramatic earthquake collapsing going on um, when this thing breaks open. Um, of course, the, the physics involved in an ocean, sub-ocean coming up onto the ground and being ejected, right? Would be under, it would be under enormous pressure. Oh yeah. And you get, you get stratospheric ejection of water. And probably um, rocks too. Of course, yeah. And what, what happens with these asteroids that hit, right? Why don't they, Pop open the blister and, and well at this point I would suppose they're all gone but and and then where and of course the next thing you say is well there, there then should be the evidence of the collapsed ocean in the in the mantle rock and you should see hydrated boundaries with with where where earthquake pulses that go through and bounce off of in, in weird ways because it's, it isn't going to be that that rock is going to dry out Suddenly, right? You're going to get still, and it's not that every ounce of water squeezes out. You're going to have to have some highly hydrated rocks and minerals that you're going to see, which we don't see. Um, yeah. So I'd have all these questions to say. Mm, that's probably does not sound. That says yeah. that sound plausible to me. And to me, one of the things is that when we look out at planets, one of the things that seems to be very prominent about their structure is that they're basically giant density towers. They're spherical density yes. towers. The lightest stuff is on top, the heaviest stuff is in the middle, and there's a gradient between. But putting mm -hmm. water under silicates does not really work from a density standpoint. Yeah, and, and it's, I mean, it's hard enough for, for magma chambers to stay there for very long, right? And they don't stay um, very long. They, they like to explode no. and get out of there. It's called it's called volcanoes. This we were we just saw this amazing thing because they used to be working at the Kilauea volcano in Hawaii, and the Kilauea volcano has had an amazing collapse of a magma chamber and all kinds of crazy stuff happened. So yes, I, I don't think it's it's there. We 
you know, when we see other planets, that there, there's a, the one of the things that's interesting about Earth is that it's relatively, um, it, it has, it has significant stratification. And one of the things in particular is that we've got a, we've got a core on Earth that has, besides, you know, uh, nickel iron, has a reasonable amount of uranium thorium in it. It's okay. one of the reasons, it's one of the heat sources of Earth. Why is all that material down in the center of the Earth? Well, um, if our model of how the Earth moon system is reasonably correct, then somewhere between about 50 million to 100 million years after the Earth formation, Earth got hit by a large object, let's say a Mars class object. And the two, the collision of the two caused you know, a large part of the, 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 the pair to vaporize. And and, and it looked like, and that the heavy materials sunk to the center, that, that the pre-collision Earth was, was a, a somewhat uniform ball of stuff. I mean, the, 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 our model, one of the models of, of planetary formations is that planets that create going around small planetesimals, and you get basically dust bunny, and you get this uniform material, but the Earth had a, a, a melting and a sinking in of materials to a core. Um, which is really quite fortunate. The, the, the moon, by the way, is the, is the bullet that went through the Earth and it didn't have enough escape velocity to, to, to keep going, so it got captured. And, that would be a pretty cool um, show to watch from far oh, away. That would have been fun. I mean, somebody 65 million light years away with really good telescopes watching us would, would see that thing and go, damn. Yeah. Happened to them, right? They, they, you know, Earth got smacked. That would have been that would be an impressive thing to see. Of I'm sorry, of the dinosaur playing stuff. That would be nothing compared to the formation of the Earth about 4.5 billion years ago, right. where it got hit by these two planets, went bang, and 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 the resulting foliage. You, you, you Earth probably had this this ring like Saturn for a while, and then it created to a moon. That would have been really spectacular. But of course, you'd have to be. Those people are like four, you know, four and a half billion light years away and, and they're harder for us to hear. So <laughs> I, I would prefer the people that watching the, the tiny pea-sized speck hit the, uh, uh, compared to pea-sized hit the, the, the sun, see the dinosaurs go. Okay. With your exception, of course. You know, well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I managed, well, I wasn't around for the formation of the moon, obviously, because, you know, mm -hmm. there were no dinosaurs for billions of years after that. Essentially, mm -hmm. essentially from, from that kind of cosmic time scale, Dinosaurs are in the category of now, yeah. and not in the category of the, back then. Um, back then, but yeah. So, <clears throat> so, so that original question about do you do the space telescope or do you do the probes? Um, I've laid the cases for both. For you, as a biologist, what would be more satisfying? Uh, well, first, I'm I'm not a professional biologist. I'm a I'm a, a very interested and I think well versed. Uh, lay person in the field who can have who can actually have real conversations oh, okay. with biologists but um okay i would All say right. honestly that in the short term i would actually prefer the telescopes um i think that there is a the chances that we'll see something interesting i find i personally i just think it's a little bit higher um because mm -hmm. to me uh, I'm I'm always pessimistic about like oh we have this one chance to go find a life form well it's like then we're probably not going to find it but on the other yeah. hand if we can find really weird chemistry someplace that is a really good indication and it can give us ideas about what kinds of things to look for in the future sure. in a way that going to Europa or Mars may not and so I think that it's a yeah. It's a more logical progression to go for the telescope, and then later when we you have, have a much greater sample size, right? You have a much uh, a much more diverse set of things because one of the things, even if we don't find life, but we find the conditions and understand the better the range of conditions and and the range of of geologies on planets and weather systems on planets, other planets around there. You know, if we have a better understanding of what planets can do rather than just there's a bunch of them. Right. That's going to give you really good information. If nothing else, because then you can sit there and say, well, all right, here are conditions. Let's go and concentrate on 
this plant around that star, that star, that star because of, of, of mm -hmm. reasons there. Uh, yeah. So it's not as satisfying as finding stuff on Europa or Mars or yeah. Enceladus. Look, but it, beyond that, when you start getting beyond that, is you get thinner yeah. and thinner opportunities in our solar system. Obviously, I would love to go to an aquarium and see a European crab or something in some sure. weird pressurized dark room. Like that would be amazing. That would be great. But <clears throat> it's one of those things where it's like the chances are pretty iffy as far as I'm concerned that that's a realistic possibility. And I think the chances are pretty good that we could find weird chemistry out in space. Plus, while we're looking and getting ideas there, we can also be developing things like our probe technology. Because yeah. a probe launched 20 years from now is going to be a lot better than a probe launched now. And if we're Absolutely. going to... Absolutely. A telescope 20 years from now and so forth as well. Right. But the thing is, I, I feel like probes have a much lower success rate. For instance, about yes. half of probes sent to Mars fail completely. It's, it's hard. Yeah. So, space, space. whereas when it comes to space telescopes, they have a pretty decent success record of just being a telescope that works. Yeah. And, and, and we have multiple telescopes, and, and we're getting better at detection right. systems. So and that even, is improving. And I think the amount of information you can get from exploring the light, be it radio to infrared, and whatever, around, uh, and, and around uh, and, uh, nearby, you know, nearby part of our cosmos, um, we can get a lot of stuff. There's, there's plenty of planets, and there's lots of information to see. Even if, even if what we find is a planet that could be hospitable, but doesn't yet have life, right? Because maybe it's too early, or maybe it died out. You know, those, those are things to, to, to tell. Right. Um, so so uh, I think, yeah, that's where I would, I would sit down. But um, so, so our planetary scientists talk about being able to detect imperfect replication because of the electromagnetic radiation that comes from the planet. Um, but how would biologists say that's life? So would you... that's one of the interesting things because it's not all that easy to define life given that we have this no. small sample size again. So there's a lot of things that life on Earth has in common that we're not sure if that's important for saying that that's what it means to be life. Um, so, for instance, uh, sometimes we'll say things like, oh, it has to be able to replicate. Well, there are things on Earth that can basically replicate, like uh, hypercycles, and mm -hmm. we don't really consider them life. And then we say yeah. things like, oh, well, what about a metabolism? And then the same thing is true. There are things on Earth that basically metabolize things, but we don't really quite call them life. Um, and a fairly recent definition is actually any chemical system capable of undergoing evolution. Yes. And that, that imperfect replication right. system is, is there. Because again, let's say you have some sodium and you have some, some chlorine to get together and they form table salt. Right. That's not life. That's chemistry, right? Right. You want something that's com rich enough, complex enough, and an environment with enough time that it that it goes in interesting places. But then the problem there is that with that definition of life, it makes it almost impossible to determine if there's life anywhere without physically standing there and examining the chemical systems involved. So then the question is, well, could we detect life on another planet from Earth with that definition? And the answer is not with any degree of certainty. Yeah. We could say that um, there are analogous reactions going on to what we see or would expect for life, but does that make it life? I don't know. Sure. Maybe. Now, one of the things is that, that, that assuming that general relativity is, is true. That's and a reasonable that assumption. Yeah, you know, and it cannot transmit information faster than the speed of light. Um, and that, that, it, that to say we don't know how warp, the physics of warp drive would work. Um, it means that if you're going to have a communication with an extraterrestrial, it means that you've got to say hello and you've got to go out there and they receive it and turn around and say hi back, right? That one-way loop, the ping yeah. pong loop. Um, so if people, you know, I, I listen to this podcast, you know, you probably have 
at the most extreme 50 light years to send something out, take 50 years, they happen to receive it and respond and it comes back 50 years later in right. their lifetime. And there's that first just basic handshake. That would be the first yeah. communication with ET. 50 light years is a pretty small environment. It is really <clears throat> unlikely that there is some intelligent civilization right now within 50 light years. We have a pretty good, we, you know, we scan the universe pretty well. Again, big universe out there, but, but for nearby stuff, it would, it would be very unlikely that in your lifetime, Oh, you yeah. will hear about an exchange well, Landon, with someone out out there. I'm 150 million years old, so. Oh, okay. I mean, but, so your, your lifetime, lifetime but, but, your, your lifetime. Your viewer, your average viewer's lifetime <laughs> is, uh, is, uh, is is more likely to be the case. So, what does that say? Uh, also, visiting, right? Let's say if we found really solid evidence that there's some really rich chemistry going on in this planet. And we see all these weird carbon or silicon chemical systems that say, yeah, it looks like that. Let's send a probe there. Yeah. Um, it's not going to get there in your lifetime. Yeah. Very unlikely that you'd have direct communication with, with that in, in your lifetime. On the other hand, for the people living today, pretty young people, I think there is a reasonable, plausible chance that we're going to have this, these, these, not just Goldilocks zone planets, but there's something going on in that planet, that planet, that planet. And the first one will be controversial, but they get to the point like black holes where they say, yeah, there's probably life going on there and there and there and there, right? Right. I think in your lifetime, you'll begin to move from the, is just like, is there a planet besides our solar system to there's thousands of them, I think we'll begin to move into the, it might be, life might not be things and and in their lifetime we'll be able to do a much better job of talking about the amount of life in the nearby region of space assuming it's it's hopefully it's it's, it's greater than zero well right. besides earth yeah but but that's i think that's where we're, we're headed and and that's we're going to get that type of thing from um uh, from telescopes probes are probably going to give us something that's pretty similar to our solar system, maybe less satisfying. So I think if I had to choose, I would put my bets on telescopes as yeah. much as I like probes and going to planets. Agreed. If I had to choose between the two and I couldn't pick both. Right. So I'm going to take a quick break. Um, I need a little bit more water. I have a little bit of cough. Landon has been hearing it. Fortunately, I've been sparing the audience most of that. Very, very but, um, so I can, can entertain the planet's yeah. audience while it's uh, there. So, so I'd like to ask you, the audience, um, what, um, and you could put in a chat, um, you know, way, you know, if, if, if you think we should be, if you had that choice where you could do one or the other, telescopes, number one, space probes and nearby, you know, objects in their solar system, number two, type number one, if you think we should, you, you would do just the telescopes or two, you would do just the space probes. No threes, no you know, rational, irrational numbers with it. One or two, and, and, let, let, and maybe sort of why. And, and when the dapper dinosaur comes back, we can see um, what you think about it. Again, I tried, I, that the question was excellent, and I tried to give you sort of reasons to go number one and number two, pun intended. Uh, but but we'll see when he comes back um, if anyone's type one or two um, who the what the, what the poll is. I think we need to do both. I, mean, I think Europa is a really good place to to send probes to, and we're getting that started. Um, I think exploring Mars you get there before people do, uh, and then better telescopes. So I just ask audience oh. one telescopes two. Uh, okay. Probes, if they had to do one. Well, come on, guys. There's they... there's 15 of you. Only two votes. I want to see at least five more votes. You have to have a sample size up there. I mean, otherwise. Okay, so otherwise that's, we could de That's two if ones. Not, oh, it's still tied. Now it's two two. Oh, two two. So, <clears> so <throat> again, I, and I hope I gave both things. I would vote one. I would too. Um, just just because of the amount of information. We're, we have a much better chance of learning from one only 
than we might from yeah. two of them. Now, the thing about two is if you went to Europa, you'd learn a bunch of stuff about planets, but we're talking about the biology point of view. Um, it's so how long does a biological system last? Well, it depends on what you mean by a biological system. That's one of the things. How, how long does an individual organism last? The maximum... No, the, oh, like a okay. biosphere? No, but, but like, do the origin thing. Okay, well, so, so, I mean, an organism... Some of the oldest organisms we know of are seven, 8,000 years old, probably. And they're usually uh, fungi or plants. And they're usually mm -hmm. uh, a clonal colony that's connected by either a mycelial network or a root system. So, for instance, there's a several thousand year old aspen tree grove in uh, Utah called the Pando Forest. Every single aspen trunk that's there is its own trunk with its own leaves, but the roots are all connected and they're all genetically identical. And um, there are fungal networks that are the same way in various places. So, <clears throat> an individual organism can apparently last maybe up to 10,000 years, but a biosphere. That's another interesting question, because, so, the biosphere on Earth is probably about two and a half to three billion years old. But for almost all of that, it hasn't been doing anything that you would consider interesting from an astronomical standpoint. Yes, because imagine if you're on, you know, a, a star, maybe, let's say, 50 light years away, and you're looking at Earth. Most of the time you look at Earth, you might conclude, eh. Yeah, it would be pretty boring most of the time. There's this one and, little and very section. very difficult to detect. Yes, go ahead. Right. <clears throat> There's a little section in the last maybe three quarters of a billion years where Earth suddenly becomes really weird, chemically speaking. Amounts of free oxygen just shoot up. Amounts of carbon dioxide also do weird things, like they start fluctuating all over the place. Sure. And, um, yeah, it, but it only does that for a very small part of the period of time when life has been around. And uh, life probably won't make it another billion years on Earth. So it seems like the detectable lifespan for a biosphere like Earth's might be as short as 1.5 billion years. Which yeah. sounds and, like a long and... time. But cosmically speaking, right. it's it's not that long. So and 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 even then, um, you know, if you saw things like you know, the, the oxygen spikes and some of that sort of stuff, you might be limited to detecting life on a you know, let's say fifty light years away by maybe the last hundred to hundred million years, right? When things got really go going well, you know, rich in the atmosphere. Even then, it'd be hard. So. Um, then the, so that's the question about, you know, if you look at Earth for a longer time, you might not conclude that it's, it's, it's as light yeah. on it. Now, or it would be hard for you to do that. Another uh, factor... Is, how long does it last? Well, another factor is that um, how long is the source of energy going to last? So for Earth, that's the sun. And for any reasonable... Uh, idea for an exoplanet with life that I've heard of. Ultimately, it's the sun still. So yeah. <clears throat> then it raises questions. Well, not all stars last the same amount of time. If life developed around, say, a class B main sequence star, I'm, we would never find it. It would just be gone too fast. It yeah. wouldn't last long. But what if something developed around a class M star that orbited really tightly, and maybe there was a habitable ring around the Terminator? Yeah. Well, that could last so, for trillions of sure. years. I mean, literally sure. trillions. And, and, and so the question comes back, on the case of Earth, right, and you say, well, um, you know, the sun goes in its giant phase in roughly six billion years from now, but even before then, the Earth's in trouble. Right. In, in the roughly two billion years from now <clears throat> range, the, the continental plates have locked up, um, the, the lightning and so forth has caused hydrogen to escape, and the amount of water gets becomes depleted and you start to get a basically a dry desert around the equator and um you know water locked into polar caps right mm -hmm. um so the dry desiccated earth is a couple billion years from now before the sun bakes us right so 
Um, if life's going to get off Earth and establish a foothold elsewhere, it's got it probably got a you know, billion, two billion years to do that, assuming it lasts that long. That's optimistic. I would we, say 500 million years is on, a, on an outside, realistically. Yeah. I mean, life might be able to evolve as Earth gets more uncomfortable, but... Will it be uh, the kind of life that can escape? That becomes less that, and less likely. A, there, there's a, that, that's another good question. And so, um, and we've seen the first biosphere get reset. I mean, the, the 65 million years ago, uh, just the crater oh. was extinguished only about 78%. Landon, 80%. There, there is a 90 to 95% extinction event in the fossil record. It is called the yeah. Great Dying, and it's the end yeah. Permian. And that was probably caused by flood basalt eruptions. So, so are, you are you talking about, there's also an event that was uh, 255 million years ago. And once it's finally new to all the ones that, so the that one, are, we know we have impactor. Right? So this one probably wasn't an impactor, but it is the the most significant decrease in biodiversity in the fossil record to date. And it was, yeah, uh, Michael Apple says the Siberian traps. And yeah, so at the end of the Permian period, which was already a pretty tough time for life, it was not, it, life wasn't doing super great anyway, but essentially large sections of what's now russia just turned into lava as lava just erupted yeah. everywhere and um it formed the siberian traps and life virtually all life forms larger than about a rat that were on land died and almost everything in the oceans died yeah and it so, took... so if we've had we've had some pretty bad extinction events but right. life kept going well part of that is that conditions improved eventually conditions will start to worsen and never improve on earth yeah so, so how long so let's say instead that that now the other problems would say you talk about m class stars um one of the people should know is that the the more mass of the star the shorter its lifetime mm -hmm. and so you know stars that have mass of two to three times our solar mass last on the order of tens to hundreds of millions of years, right? They're, they're, they're very short, as opposed to one solar mass, like our sun, is around 10 and a half billion years. When you get things that have tens of solar mass, or so almost to the point of brown dwarfs, um, then they can last for you know, fused for, for a, a trillion years or more. Yeah. The, the, one of the problems on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the low end is that those, um, you know those stars are erratic. Right. Some of the, unfortunately, some of the, the red dwarf, brown dwarf stars have these periodic outbursts. And, and we don't yet really have a good idea about how many of those stars are stable, and how many of the stars are erratic. Right. But the assumption is if your sun keeps going blast at you and you don't have a really good magnetic field, or that, that, that's going to cause problems. Yeah. Um, but... But there, 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 there's, there's also arguments that there are these low mass stars that live a long time that are relatively stable. Now, the other problem, of course, is you're in a galaxy and other things come around and mess, mess up. I mean, stars pass by. Uh, and we have, for example, you know, the last 7,000 years, there was a star that got pretty close to the outer edge of the Oort cloud. And we've had other stars that are, gonna, that are approaching us. Um, again, not hit us, but I mean, within like a... Yeah, stellar less collisions likely. are very unlikely, but gravitational disruptions yeah. are much less unlikely. Yeah, and, and what that tends to do is shake out all the dandruff, and all this material rains down into the center where you know, it, hits, it hits Earth. So Earth can have these bombardment periods as, as, as it swims, you know, goes around on the, in, in the Milky Way, and there are stars you know, crossing and, and orbiting near us. They can cause bombardment uh, situations. So some of these problems that can occur by heavy bombardment that can cause issues can come from um, some of these periodic events yeah. in our in our galaxy. So how long? So if if how long do you have on a planet that's beginning to evolve, chemicals to evolve before that conditions are? stop the, 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 the chemical system because the star goes bang and that's or the, and that's one of the or, things where it's again we have such a low sample size that I, 
it's it's hard to even begin to come up with a number because is good good oh because you know life has gone through a few cycles but it's probably safe to say that life has probably been detectable on earth for probably about 700 million years at least i mean maybe yeah, even maybe even a billion on, depending on how good your detectors are and whether you're paying right. attention and so forth yeah um, now now an intelligent so-called intelligent civilization that puts on radio shows and tv programs that sort of thing how long do those systems where you can have an interesting conversation as opposed to a microbe, how long do those things last? So I'm going to go out and say that I'm extremely pessimistic on that one. And um, there are some reasons for that. One is that we just haven't found anything that could even be remotely taken as being that. Another mm -hmm. is that um, if such a civilization lives long enough, it seems hard to see why they wouldn't spread not only out of their home planet, but perhaps even their home star system. And once you do that, once you can start colonizing other planetary systems, the growth of that civilization becomes exponential, and it doesn't actually take that long to colonize the whole galaxy, yet that doesn't seem to have ever happened. So it seems like in the whole history of the universe, no civilization in the Milky Way has ever managed to get out of its solar system. Well, it's funny you mentioned that there there is a a, a paper I want people to it's and it's, it was just published in the Astronomical Journal. The title is called the Fermi Paradox. I'm sorry, the Aurora Effect. The, the Civilization Settlement. You're breaking up a little bit. Okay, the sorry, the Fermi again. Paradox. The Fermi. Okay, the Fermi Paradox and the Aurora Effect. Okay. Exo civilization ex settlement expansion and steady states. The Astronomical Journal, uh, Volume One Fifty Eight, Number Three. I am That's linking an interesting it. article by Carol Lillenbeck, Frank Wright, and Shaw. It's a it's a scholarly journal, and they they you see the abstract there. Um, I don't know if there's there's that member of of AES, so so I get these sort of things, but it it really is. It's, it's a good article, and there may be ways you can find the PDF on it, or you can ask the authors. But but um, it was just you know, published uh, August 20, 2019. Oh, that um, is very recent. Astronomical Journal, Volume 158, Number 3. Uh, and I recommend people take a look at this article, because again, people are asking these questions about, and, and, and they're talking about migration within the galaxy and, and how the galaxy helps move stuff around and, and what would be life that, that you know, okay. um, speed, you know, considering the speed of, of advancing civilization front to turn the galaxy can become inhabited with space varying civilizations on time scales shorter than its age, right? And so right. There, there's, there's a, that, Take a look at that because people are, are, are really thinking about this in a yeah. scholarly fashion. And I linked it and, in the chat uh, and I also added it to the video description. So, um, yeah. Just, yeah. Just, just came out and, but, but your, 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 your comments are, are really important. Why would the, if you were to, let's say, let's say we're going to detect ET by hearing their radio emissions. A question becomes, well, how long does the biological system get to a point advanced enough that people start building radio transmitters, and and we can detect the the, the non-random, you know, radio emissions, electromagnetic emissions, light or whatever the thing is, um, from a a language, right? That's and the question is, well, how long would those systems last? Right. Um, because if there's a bunch of the life out there, but the time for that communication language being detectable is very short. You might have not have good yeah. odds of, of hearing one now. And another thing is we also don't know how likely it is for life intelligent enough to do that sort of thing to arise because we say, oh, well, we only know one civilization. Well, that's true. But even if there had been previous civilizations on Earth made up of other organisms, mm -hmm. it's very unlikely that we would notice it. Yeah. And, and so, and so, it's only been a period, of, small period of time in Earth's history 
where it gets this weird electromagnetic radiation coming from it that someone else might well, be able to That's another thing. We actually don't know how long that's been. It could have already happened several times, and we just don't know. Because one of the things is, let's say our civilization lasts another few thousand years. Which, I mean, that's not a, an unreasonable guess as to how long it would last. Is another few thousand years, maybe 10,000. Okay. 10, so if our civilization collapses in 10,000 years, it will have lasted for about 20,000 years. Mm -hmm. it's, very hard to pin, of... it's very hard to pinpoint anything that only lasted 20,000 years in the geological record. Sure. That's, 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 and, it's, and, and so um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to say, because we might come across a planet that's got interesting biology on it, but we won't know whether it had a civilization, that civilization is extinct or or left or or what have you. That would be a matter because if you were if you were to detect Earth biology, there would be a maybe a short window in the right. in the you know several billion year history of Earth that you'd be able to even detect right. so called language coming from it. All right. So, so we are beginning to run a little short on time. I want to try and get this sure. to be around two hours. So there is one other thing relating to, um, well, two actually related things relating to uh, the age of the universe, because that's a topic that comes up a lot with uh, creationism, which is what I primarily deal with on this channel. So <clears throat> have you ever heard of the idea of sea decay? Oh, the, the, you're talking about tired light or that the, the speed of light changes? Yes, the idea that perhaps globally the speed of light has been decreasing over the history of the universe, which explains why we have light from very distant objects despite the universe only being six to 10,000 years old. It, the problem with that process is that the speed of light is not just photons. Right. And, and how fast photons transmit in vacuum of space. But it's also fundamental to space time itself. And if if that so 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 the interesting thing is that that you know, photons that have no rest mass can only travel in a vacuum at the speed of light. That's that that that's all they can do. Right. And that's because of, it's a fundamental nature of space time. If you start changing the speed of light then you change the fundamental physics radically to the point where hydrogen can't form because the electron gets captured by the nucleus and other crazy things happen when you start shifting the speed of light off radically enough to, to have someone who says, when I say, here's light from, a, you know, from an object that's, that's traveled five billion years, and someone says, no, 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 it's only 6,000 because light got slower, tired or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. The, 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 I mean, to, to, to shift light even a tenth of a percent would radically change um, you know, atoms and chemistry and, and so forth, let alone by orders of magnitude. That, so that, that the universe would just like, the universe would, <laughs> would have a really hard time. And, and furthermore, when we look back in time, we don't see fast lights. Right. right? We, 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 we see stars shining by fusion processes. And we understand the quantum mechanical tunneling of, of, of hydrogen turning into helium. And we see supernovae going off. We see those things that are evidence that speed of light is, is the same there as it is here. Right. But, but back in time there, we have never seen a zippy light spot in there in, 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 in right because so, we we could predict the universe we could predict what that would do because we understand yeah. how that would affect physics all right so, so it's not just 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 photons speeding up it's 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 fundamental to to uh you know so reality. more recently the c decay was uh popular among creationists i would say probably 20 years ago yeah but <clears throat> for reasons like you stated uh a lot of more sophisticated, I would say, creationists have been moving away from it. And instead, I've recently heard the idea that what if the speed of light is actually not the same in all directions, but that light has a different travel time depending on whether it's going or coming back. It has 
an instantaneous travel time in one way and then a 2C speed going the other way? Um, the problem is that we see reflections, right? We, we, we can, you know, astronomers can see, for example, supernovae, and the light pulse goes out and it bounces over something and it comes back to us. Or, 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 or things like uh, 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 gravity lensing, where right. we see different paths. So we can see an event, we can see the echoes, and those echoes are consistent with light traveling away from us, bouncing off something, and coming back, right? So you see the flash, and you see the echo, because light went backwards, reflected off something, and then came forward again. And, and that's consistent, that geometry is consistent with light traveling in all, you know, the same speed in all directions. In fact, fundamental relativity is that, that light travels at the speed of light, no matter your frame of reference, right? Even if you're moving, it doesn't change. So right. speed of light is, 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 is a speed of light. <clears throat> so you'd have to overcome a lot of our facial stuff for reflections. Okay, now, there, here, here's the thing. So Kent Hovind likes to say that, well, what if all the, the things that we see in the sky were within two light days of Earth, and then God simply stretched them out into their present positions, which is why we now see them billions of light years ago away, and he did all of this within a 6,000-year time frame of the universe existence, according to him. Can you find any... So let's, let's see. Let's, let's see. So, so you have you have a cosmology where the universe was 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 compact, and then somehow it went zip by magic. And right. it, I mean, is is this is this the form of stuff where people say, well, uh, light from that quasar has been traveling billions of years. God created it with light in between. Well, it's. Right. It's a is little it, hard. Is it to, like that, or is it, or or is it the stretchy bit where it's a little bit hard to parse sometimes? But I believe that what he's saying is that this, all this light is actually from the objects, and it's not a fake movie that's being played because the universe is just created to pretend that it's older than it is. Yeah. Okay. But that in fact, uh, we're seeing objects that are really that far away, and that they were simply pulled to that position. Very quickly. So the, many times the, the speed of that, light. I mean, and, and you know, you know, expansion like 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 inflation during the the moments after the Big Bang type of thing. The, the 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 problem with that process is that that rapid expansion um, leaves the imprint on cosmology, right? You 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 you, you, you can, in fact, it's one of the what are the things about thing called bicep uh, a. a Experiment going on in the South Pole called bicep and bicep three is going to be the one confirming attempt to confirm bicep two, or it may refute it depending on what happens. But but we can detect the 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 process of that of that rapid expansion long after the rapid expansion has occurred because it has enormous effect on the on the cosmos. Right. And so we don't see that rapid expansion. We don't see a period of inflation because it would leave the imprint on the universe having gone a rapid stretch and then stop. Besides the process of, 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 of how to stop and why, um, the, 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 an ex, a, a, a cosmic inflation to give you a 6,000 year old universe that looks 13.7 billion years old would leave the imprint of that expansion on the light signals and on the gravitational waves that we, that we see. Right. Um, we see evidence of that. We don't see evidence of that. So you'd have to explain the lack of evidence of that expansion because that would be a fairly amazing thing to, to, to occur. Um, but it wouldn't just all of a sudden, nothing would notice. There'd be, there'd be consequences of that. Right. Of that zip and, and stop again. I, I also cause. think that there might be problems with trying to cram all of the phys all of the visible universe into a two di light day shell while keeping the earth something that anything could exist on yeah i mean the 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 the, the, the intense radiation of that would be, would be pretty significant and also the matter that they've got you've got light that's shining from a star all of a sudden you somehow magically pulled away well now you've got to have 
the, the star will be redshift and appear very faint before it stops again. And, and actually, then, if you were to pull it away that fast, because in many cases it would have to be several times the speed of light, wouldn't it redshift? Wouldn't the redshift approach infinity as you approach the speed of light? Well, well, actually, because space can expand faster than the speed of light. It's just right. objects can't move through space faster than the speed of light. So what you would see would be that the, the light would, would, would redshift and dim because, you know, the column, you've got, you've got a steady source between you and the, and, and the emitter, and all of a sudden you, you, you stretch it out more. Well, now those photons, you get fewer photons per second arriving, right? Because they're now stretched out, and so the light dims and also it redshifts. Um, not to infinity, but 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 you get you get like a kind of like oh, redshift expansion, and other things would happen too with regards to um, light reflecting off of, of of surfaces as as things were expanding. Right. Uh, so so we don't see evidence of that. Um, so it, it, it seems to me if you're going to you're going to invoke new supernatural stuff, just say the universe was formed with all this stuff in it already, and and. Well, the reason that I think a lot of creationists find that unsatisfying is because they realize that the difference between that and the universe having simply been formed two days ago with all of this stuff, including your memories, is essentially trivial. Yeah. There is essentially no difference. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's, that's one of the, that's, there's a philosophical argument against that, and for that, talk to Steve McRae. And, and right, and that's philosophers. one of the reasons I found those, uh, those arguments very unsatisfying, because I said, well... Yeah. <clears throat> If that's possible, then everything, including this Bible that I'm reading, that's you know, and this, uh, my mm. memories, my, you know, all these gravestones in the cemeteries full of people who are now dead but who were never alive, like, why, why is that any less consistent? And it's not. It's entirely consistent. There's no way to determine sure. the difference. And the other thing is, if we assume that the Earth was created just two days ago and everything that seems that's making it seem old is just an illusion, but it's such a perfect illusion that there's no way to test for it. Well then let's just treat it like it is that old because everything is consistent with that. So this yeah. past sure in some kind of philosophical sense might not be real, but it's as real as it possibly could be. So we just go very, with it. Very good. Good, good, good point. So um, in that case, I would say that, even if the world had been supernaturally created two days ago, it still is a 13.8 billion year old universe because yep. everything about it that you can test comes up with that answer. So, whatever. Good. So, you have any questions or other questions from the uh, chat room? <clears throat> yeah, uh, guys, get in you? any questions if you have them. Um, we're going to be wrapping up here in probably about 15 ish minutes, which also means. Um, Landon, if you have links you want to send me, uh, let maybe Twitter DM them or something, uh, and I can put them in the description. Yeah, I mean, of, of, of things. So um, I can sort of, do you, do you have that IOP science, IOP.org URL of that, of that for me? Uh, let's see, I'm seeing, right now I have the Extrasolar Plants Encyclopedia, the Square Kilometer Array, and the Fermi Paradox Aurora effect. That's the links that I have in, okay. in there right now. Um, so if we're talking about JRAM plugging of things, I, I would highly recommend that you check out the Milwaukee Atheists. Um, and Milwaukee Atheists has a, a weekly show called Atheist Sunday School. Um, you can Google Atheist Sunday School. And they, for an hour and a half, Read a couple of chapters of the Bible, but they're these folks are, are are pretty good, you know, scholars on things. They do research on the history of the evolution of Bible and of, of uh, you know early Judaism and all kinds of interesting stuff. So they, they have a bunch of, of stuff. But they also do fun things like they they just did a uh, demon summoning, where they went out and read old texts and did the act of can we summon a demon? Any success? Surprise, surprise. Uh, no, the oh. the. the, the that, that they, they either did it wrong or are not demons. They just didn't um, do enough Dungeons and Dragons beforehand. That's the problem. You have to play two, you more Dungeons and Dragons, everyone. That's my but, plug. But, but, is go, walk, go play but, Dungeons and Dragons. But I, I, can, I can see your link, or you can find a link on there for Milwaukee I, Atheist. I did find uh, MilwaukeeeAtheist.com. Uh, they have and, and every once in a while, like once a month, they forced me to 
go online and read a chapter of the Bible and I butcher those word names. But we have really a lot of fun, right? So that's one thing. Um, another one I would also give a shout out to is, is Pet Monk. Uh, he's an amazing, he's an amazing comedian uh, that does a show, for example, on mornings called The Morning Wood. And he has extraordinary talent in improvisation. And what, what was he, the name again? Then script, Pimp Monk, P I M P M U N K. Um, Pimp Monk. Huh? And and uh, and if you look at, for example, I'll go on his his title there, uh, P I M P M U N K. Um, and and his 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 YouTube channel is Pimp Monk X, P I M P M U N K X. Um, he's also known as John Crawley, um, and a very interesting uh, character of many, many ways. His 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 dad is 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 really in the hospital, really sick, so he can use viewers and, and help. Okay, her, but, but he's an amazing, amazing comedian. I am um, putting that link. Somebody that Jack, yeah, that that some atheist could be into, but he's he's a he's a lot of most funny guy. That's he's actually really really smart, but he does the country stick. Pretty well as well, so I would um, you know check out Pimp Monk X. All right, that um, is now also in the description. Yeah, so you know, a couple of folks there. Of course, of course, you have a a, a channel that people should subscribe to. Yes, uh, if and click the... if for some reason you are watching this and not subscribed, subscribe to my channel. It's Dapper Dino. It's the channel you're watching this on. So go hit that subscribe button. Hit the bell icon the so bell. you're notified. Yep. yep. And uh, also follow me on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter, my the link to my Twitter is on my channel. It's also just um, at dinosaur underscore dapper. I don't know why it went that way, but Twitter is weird, so that's just what it is. Um, yep, that's what. It... Yeah. So. Because give 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 this guy a chance to watch all his his stuff there. But yeah. anyway, because part of the thing that that help people out. And, and, and the best way for Dr. Dino is to, to subscribe and watch his stuff. Um, that 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 really helps there. So we do have a question. Monk and, and Dr. Dino. Yes. Uh, so again, for Puffleupagus, who is full of questions tonight, uh, what do Excellent. you enjoy more, technology stuff or astronomy stuff? And I would add, is there even really a huge distinction there? Because I do a lot of technology stuff related to astronomy. So, right. So that's it's a harder. I, I, I enjoy technology in using as a tool other than the end of itself. So I enjoy the technology we're using to communicate and to, to share this wonderful universe. Right. Um, so I like I like to use it. And I also have a pretty long history of 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 stuff and was involved in very early days of, of the Unix operating system, you know, internet stuff. Uh, so I've I've done a lot of technology and I, I really enjoy that, but I, I like technology as a tool where people can interact one on one, one to many, many to many, are just having fun. So that's to me technology has a purpose and it's to to to, to have fun and to, to enrich life. Um, on the other hand, we've got this amazing, I live in my favorite universe, we've got this amazing universe, and 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 the thing about I, I like about the is Cephalopagus, is that his? Uh it's Puffalopagus. Puffleupagus. I'm sorry, not the not the century. Puffleupagus. Right. Um, the thing about Puffleupagus is that science is about questions. It's not about answers. Science science values questions. If you have, if you get what you think is an answer, that's just really a stepping stone to ask more questions. Right? Yeah, answers and are kind of boring is, on their own, unless you. Yeah, dogma gives you answers. Science gives you questions. Science. So people who ask questions are are really to be to be admired, and so that's why. I, uh, I like Puffleupagus's questions because that's very that's what science is about. And 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 science when it when it when it realizes we don't understand something, we get really excited because if any you don't know something, it gives you an opportunity to try to test and learn. Right. And if you get stuff, if you get some answers, then the next question because like if we found life on another planet, then the next question becomes, well, is that are they older than us? Did we come from them? What? How similar? How different? You know, it would it would just explode once we find life elsewhere. A whole bunch of more questions. So, science is about questions. So please ask questions. Right, I agree. Um, so we're going to be closing up the stream pretty soon. I do have one quick channel announcement. That is mm -hmm. that um, 
my next subscriber count special is coming up. Uh, currently, the plan is for it to be on the 10th of this month, so in 10 days. I believe that's a Friday or something. I'll double check. Um, yeah, that's a Friday. <clears throat> uh, probably starting 6 p.m. Pacific time. So the same time this stream would have started, or did start. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, uh, the plan is to have a sort of semi-formal debate with um, the guy named Jeremy behind the channel Atheism vs. Logic. Um, we're not mm -hmm. actually going to be talking about Atheism vs. Theism because one of my rules is that I'm, I'm not here for that discussion per se. I'm here to talk about scientific data and not really that. But we're going to talk about um, evolution, genetics, transitional fossil sure. stuff. Uh, right now, the plan is for Steve McRae to be here as a moderator. And I believe uh, Cheshire Vic will probably also stop by. I'm hoping that she can help me with monitoring the chat since I'll be busy trying to uh, interact with Jeremy. Um, Jeremy is a very personable guy from what I've seen. So that's one of the reasons I'm inviting him on, him on because hopefully it won't just turn into yelling and screaming and name sure. calling. So, uh, hopefully. Stay, yeah, hopefully. I, I've never seen him do that. So I... I have every confidence that Jeremy will be a very friendly guest and that we will have an interesting Good. discussion. And if we don't, I'll just rely on Steve McRae to make funny faces and yeah. fix that and, for me. And by the way, check out Steve McRae's channel too. I, I, Absolutely, I yeah. Steve McRae's channel is one of my featured channels. So if you're on my channel page, you can find it right there. Um, so yeah, that's just my quick announcement about that. That will, at this point, I'm, I was originally gonna have a 500 subscriber special. But now I'm past 750 as of today. I started, I started out Sunday evening with 447, and now I'm at 774, so. Cool. Yeah, so things are going a little crazy, so I'm not sure exactly what the number is going to be. If you guys can get me to 1,000, there will be super chats that I'll have to read. You can make me say whatever you want, as long as the YouTube censors aren't gonna send the ban hammer. But um, you can make me say pretty much whatever you want if you can get me to a thousand subscribers. So, hey, and, and and you get to have him talk about what it was like, you know, for the dinosaurs before us mammals came around. And yeah, well, I mean, everything. so there were basically mammals when I was hatched. So, but you weren't, you hadn't ruined everything yet. Yeah, that's that's it, and and, and there was no very it was, we didn't have a world of plastic. Yeah, there was no plastic, although. There are good things about plastic. Like, there are definitely a lot of people who would be dead without plastic, so... But it's... isn't it true that plastic is, based, is, is effectively liquefied dinosaurs? Isn't that like... Uh, so, no, like... most plastic ends up coming from a, a period called the Carboniferous, which is before oh. dinosaurs even evolved. And most oh. of it actually is ultimately derived from plant matter, not even animals. So, it's a bit oh. of a myth that fossil fuels are liquefied dinosaurs. Oh, okay. But that's, that's, I mean, you would, you would know, obviously. Yeah, um, I, of course. There, but no, none of my family is, a, is currently made, has been turned into plastic. So don't worry. But, but, but did that, did that, that, you know, the, the meter asteroid strike, which by the way, uh, one of our prize things we found in Antarctica was a nodule, a cinnamon site nodule, a, a radium platinum nodule, which came from the original asteroid family of that impactor. That, that's what it is why we have a really strong evidence that that thing that hit off the Yucatan Peninsula about 65 million years ago was in fact an asteroid and not a comet. But that probably, you know, ruined some people's days given. Oh, it ruined a lot of days. I mean, my, it wasn't much fun for me that day because, you know, but you know what? Well, I, you, were asleep, were you, you were asleep during the time and that's how you survived? Well, so, I mean, I don't want to give up all my secrets, but let's just say this. I had already survived the extinction of the rest of my species and ecosystem. One little comet or asteroid wasn't going to be my downfall. So, so if you get him to a thousand, then he might reveal some family secrets that yeah. here to have, have, have been kept underground. I mean, you guys have already heard my butler's voice. So, I mean, anything's possible once I hit a thousand. Yes. So. So uh, we're gonna tell people that and subscribe. Yeah. So go go share my videos. Get people to subscribe because, like I said, if if uh, the twentieth can become a thousand subscriber stream, it'll be even more fun because it'll be much easier to catch all the questions, and uh, 
you can make me say all sorts of ridiculous things. Uh, if you want, you can even yep. request that I say them in a funny voice. I don't care, whatever. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think we're gonna say good night, Landon. Thank you so much Thank for you. coming on. I had a lot of fun. I hope you did too. I um, did too, and, and 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 excellent questions from your your chat. Yes, chat room. They were very yes. uh, very astute questions. I, I attract a very intelligent so audience. I attract a very intelligent audience. So and I appreciate them very much. But I'm gonna say good night. And uh, I will see you all next time. Expect a scripted video between now and the next subscriber special, but no promises as to exactly when. All right, good night. Oh.